This is Lynn Fraser with the Killaby Center for Recovery and the Radical Recovery Summit. And I'm so happy to be here today with Pete Walker. He's written a couple of books that have made a big difference to me personally and in the work that I do with people. And one is Complex PTSD from Surviving to Thriving. And another one is The Tao of Fully Feeling. Now we have COVID-19, where in fact, other people are not safe. We don't know who has the virus. We're isolated. We're not connecting the way we might have been, or maybe we're just even more isolated than we had been. So can you talk about that a little bit? What would you say about that? Oh man, you hit a nerve. I'm feeling I'm feeling, I'm feeling verklempt because <laughs> it's really hard. It's really it's, hard. You know, I have my yeah. thank God I you know, my wife's my best friend and 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 my son and thank God I have them, but you know I, we're much more social than that. We, you know, yeah. as recovery progresses, you get more safe relationships in your life. So I'm missing that in my life. I got four really close male friends who are my my age in their 60s and 70s, and we 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 feel like we can't risk infecting yeah. each other. We might be silent carriers and asymptomatic. So it's hard. So it's really hard. And so it is very triggering of these emotional flashbacks into the abandonment. Silver lining, you got more time. You're probably not working, especially if you're not working. Mm-hmm. And I'm hearing from a lot of people, I'm seeing in my own clients, that they're putting that time into building this more nurturing and loving and accepting relationships with themselves. Mm-hmm. Allowing their psyche to, to not... One way of looking at this is the psyche becomes all superego. The superego is the first development in the child learning what the rules are so you fit in and that just goes viral in the brain for the child trying to figure out what the rules are to be safe Mm -hmm. it's all about perfectionism takes over which is tends to be a super ego kind of thing Mm -hmm. and so this is an opportunity to see that more clearly it's painful but pain for me is luckily for me something in me i just oh for a long time, for the last 30 years, I went for the pain. I, it's like, I want to have a relationship with myself where there's nothing inside of myself that I'm going to run away from, avoid, suppress, shame. Right. And so going for that, going for that right now and, and using the, the book or the, the flashback management steps to help you realize, okay, I'm not going to pathologize myself because I'm feeling worse right now. It makes sense, you know, of course, you know, it is lonely and it reminds me of these other lonely times and oh, yeah. well, I become some of it. I, I need to grieve for that little kid. I need to grieve for that person I was 10 years ago. I need to grieve from the fact that I live in a body in this world and that loneliness is an existential variable that we all have to deal with sometimes. Sometimes you're just lonely, even when you've got a lot of friends who are lonely. Mm-hmm. There's nothing, in my experience, that helps you out of that loneliness and dissolves fear like a good cry. Mm-hmm. It's just miraculous. I just had so many experiences. It took me a long time. I, had, I Most of us men have that shamed out. We didn't have, to have it shamed out in the family. It shamed out by other men who had it shamed out by them. But when I, first, when I really got into understanding what that was about and became the best addiction I ever had was trying to find ways that opened up my tears and because the very first time it happened to me it was kind of like oh my god I was just so relieved and since I've had thousands of experiences of being in one of those flashbacks where it's obsessive compulsive warning you know Uh what if this happens what what about this and just jumping around in this terrible cognitive kind of pain and I've had thousands of experiences of being in that place and having a good cry and it just goes away. It's almost miraculous. It's like, where to go? And I've come to feel like breathing is so important because it's emotional pain, the pain of not being loved, especially by yourself. And when you can cry in self-compassion for yourself, it lets out that pain. It lets out that fear. It lets out the shame. And there's, it's like that the, the fear and the sh- unreleased shame is like the emotional fuel of the negative thinking. 
uh -huh. the painful thinking. And to the degree that it's accumulated or unresolved, it just fuels that. And there, there is, I, I so encourage people to grieve uh, to, the, to the degree you can do that. And to, as your access improves, you've got this in, incredible, and this is one of the steps, flashback management steps. Mm -hmm. You temporarily, at least, exhaust the fuel supply and suddenly your brain is free to look around and go, oh my God, the colors look a lot better right now. And look at that bird, but well, how come I didn't notice that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, something you just said kind of landed on me too, that grief of abandoning ourselves or the grief of not loving ourselves. And even though it's not something we've deliberately done, it's, it's an effect of the trauma. It's an effect of the trauma. Our relationship yeah. with ourselves is based on the relationship that was modeled to us. Right. Mm -hmm. I, you know, this... Complex PTSD is also called developmental trauma disorder. Right. And I like that as a, as a secondary name for it. I, I like the, both of them equally. And mm -hmm. in my mind these days, I see the biggest developmental trauma is not being allowed to develop a positive relationship with yourself. Right. It's, it's just the worst thing. To, to, you, there's no safety in there. There's mm -hmm. no shame, judgment, worrying futurizing negative things happening. The good news is with practice and with, you know, the kinds of structures that I'm advocating, you, you can gradually reduce that. The bad news is it's, it's painful to, to, to actually see it. Like, oh. right. and I, I used to put the, it's, it's, it's hard to know whether, the, in terms of the worst developmental trauma, is it, in, in, one, in some ways it's that you didn't get the positive relationship. You could say that's the worst. Mm -hmm. So you, I guess they're both the worst. Uh, one comment, but to the, no matter how much positive feedback you're getting from the outside world, until you work on the relationship with yourself, to, o to open up, to feel like you deserve good treatment, right. it doesn't help. But yeah, usually you know, for, when recovery is really good, it's a yin-yang process. You're working on the relationship with yourself and you've got a friend or a recovery group or a therapist who's really safe and affirming and, and helping you see, you know, when you mean to yourself and encouraging you to be kind to yourself. So as you're talking, what I'm thinking about partly is the polarizing of people now and how we so often are, I suspect that part of the reason people can't connect with each other and, and we see each other as the enemy and I mean, there's just so much chaos as we're recording this we've just had uh, that black man um, oh, yeah. suffocated to death by a police officer in Minneapolis and that kind of disconnection and inhumanity is hard to stay kind of positive around like hope for people it seems to me that people are so traumatized and so disconnected how are we going to find our way back to some kind of kindness for ourselves and each other? Well, well, one way is to try and protect ourselves to go from going into all or none thinking mm -hmm. about people's unkindness, because it isn't everybody. That's and true. It, part of the dangerousness of these times is that the news is so bad, and the news has to be focused on on the code, we need to know in order to, have to try and get some kind of safety, but paradoxically, if we're too saturated with it, then we're feeding the inner critic. It's almost like subtext for the critic is, see, I told you the world is a shitty place and terrible place to be. Right. And we can miss out on seeing that there are kind people and there are, there are good enough people. And in fact, I take a lot of heart. I'm really blessed for my book to have done well. and get lots of um, really kind, validating messages from people and hearing their stories about how they are getting rid of narcissists in their life and making better relationships. And personally, I believe that we are evolving even though the evidence around us looks pretty dire. I think evolution has always been something, you know, in, in contemporary evolution, 
I mean, in traditional evolution, it's the moth that comes out with a slightly different coloring in its wings that makes it safer. Mm -hmm. That one starts to propagate more. And I think with people, it's the same thing. They're, they're, you know, there's, there's regressive Trumpian kinds of people, narcissistic people in charge, you know, that, that are making us look like we're only devolving. But there's always been some human beings that are evolving and that believe in kindness and compassion. And I'm very heartened by just online how many groups there are, recovery groups and support groups. And just hear about more and more. You could just you could just Google any support group for any kind of common problem and you find a list of people that help. So I think there is a small percentage of the population, maybe not that small, maybe 10%, maybe 20, uh, that are evolving. You know, the, the lifetime growth that the ger gerontologists tell us, the lifetime learning that the gerontologists are telling us is necessary to avoid Alzheimer's. A life of learning, a life of expansion, a life of knowing more. You know, and it's, you see a lot more of it on the coasts than in the centers, but I think any big cities has sanctums of, of this kind of thing. And I, I take part in that. Mm -hmm. So I want to be moderate in following the news. It's right. really hard sometimes. It's so easy to read every article and get sucked up in everything. And, mm -hmm. and the news sells itself by being hyperbolic and hysterical. And we'll get you into kind of one one symptom from one person out of the hundred of the million. You're all going to get that. You know. So trying to filter it out and and cultivate part of cultivating this real positive relationship with ourselves is developing habits, intellectual habits, behavioral habits that make us feel good about being here. So many people tell me about how nature has saved them when mm -hmm. they were a kid, you know, getting yeah. out in nature, seeing beauty. Uh, mm -hmm. And we need to protect ourselves from too much of the news, partly because it really hits on our fear response and then we go back into fight, flight, freeze, fawn. Exactly. Yeah. So one thing I'm noticing is there's a certain amount of um, uh, peer pressure in a way, maybe, or compliance around masks and how people are social distancing or not. Um, do you want to just maybe, if there's something you want to say about that, how do people work with that? You're in an environment, for instance, uh, a friend of mine was at a 90th birthday party for her dad and everybody else there was no one was wearing a mask. Everyone was hugging him. This was just a couple of days ago. And she felt really awkward, not with her mask and, and socially distancing. How do we kind of stay steady in the face of that kind of pressure? And I think it probably works the other way too. Yeah. Um, the first thing that comes to my mind is, well, not expecting ourselves to stay steady with it. I mean, it is, mm -hmm. it, it, we are, divided country politically and there, you know, there's always, I mean, it's part of du duality. It's part of the Tao of human existence, conservatives and, and liberals. And um, there are gonna be some situations like the one you, the hard one you just described, how awful, I mean, how do you handle that? You know, it's kind of like, you know, if it was me, I'd make them all go home, but. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's okay. Maybe my grandfather doesn't want that. Maybe, you know, that's part of the thing, you know, some, so I, I, at first when I saw people without masks, it made, made me upset. And, I, and then I realized this is just how it's going to be, you know, some people are going to do it, some aren't. And mm -hmm. um, I want to choose my battles. I want to, I don't, you know, I don't want to get stuck in the negative out of critic noticing of it and have all my upset just kind of go into being pissed off at them. And, it's understandable to me why some people, it's understandable why those people are demonstrating against it. I mean, they're on their last paycheck. They were probably on their last paycheck five weeks ago and they're scared shitless. Right. I, I, feel, for, I feel for both sides of it and it's mm -hmm. hard. I, you know, I, you know, I hope and pray that, you know, we're, that this thing is going to be So one of the things that you, that you really stress is being able to feel 
And it's so hard when people are in pain to turn towards that. Can you talk about that a little bit? How do you encourage people or, I mean, I think part of we, we're encouraged because when we try it, it works, we feel better. Mm -hmm. but you get to that where that's just what you want to do. You want to go in and, and feel what's here. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm doing a lot of psychoeducation with people and um, particularly about um, the need to grieve, the need to have, so I say there's two other key um, relational developmental arrests in terms of the developmental trauma disorder. One is the um, arrested self-protection, which is based in healthy anger. This one, mm -hmm. and one of the first things a kid, kids are really fine tuned to see fairness. And I think because fairness is a fundamental part of intimacy. To the degree that we treat each other as equals, to the degree that I'm as interested in you as you are in me, to the degree that we each have a vote on what we're gonna do, what we're gonna choose. Um, and then to the degree that we uh, welcome the whole other person to be there, we're not gonna be unfair and expect them to be up all the time because that's impossible. Right. Mm -hmm. um, to that degree, uh, have we um, gotten our sense of uh, self-compassion back and relational compassion back. And so I'm preaching a lot about self-compassion and this idea of the addictions, the, the being stuck in the four Fs, being stuck in negative noticing um, creates more pain. It's just less, it's, it's, a, it's a more lingering, ongoing pain that you've kind of gotten used to, but it's causing all these deficits in your life. And that there's a way to move through a lot of that. And that's through grieving. Grieving lets the pain come out in the way, through these mechanisms that are part of our true nature. And when we can give that to each other, when we have a cry together, or I make you feel safe enough, you could have a good cry. Because I've seen the same thing with my clients. They come in, they're just full of worry. And I finally, we finally got to the place where, hey, you critics really but, bumming you out for this. and seems to me like, well, yeah, it is hard. And maybe you can kind of drop down and try and feel what's going on in your body. And bring your awareness into your, into your belly. And when we get into that level, we could cry. And oh my God, we, we just should shift into, oh, you know, it's kind of a nice day. I, like, I saw this really nice movie last night. And, right. And, mm -hmm. We can't really access that when we're blocking everything off. We block off all the good stuff too. Yes, yeah. that's, that's right. Yeah. So I I love how you work on all these different levels. So it is important to understand in our cognitive mind, and then we also need to work in the body. Yes, yes. Yeah. You can only go so far with the cognitive. Right. And that's why I'm I'm trying to empower the cognitive work with the emotional tools of using the healthy anger. Mm -hmm. And that gets you down in your anger, uh, anger to protect yourself and using the healthy tears to feel, to cry for yourself, to cry for the terrible losses you have. It's a death. You know, Kubler-Ross, his idea that you get over the death of someone you love by having crying and, and angry. Well, there's right. all kinds of death. And the death of having a positive relationship with yourself is one of the, just one of the worst. You can end the cycle of Changing, addi changing addictions by going for the pain, that a pain is a clarion beacon of hope, even though it's hard to open to, but you can, by opening to your pain with compassion, you can really learn to not be afraid of it anymore and to metabolize and work it through so much more efficiently. The Killaby Center for Recovery is reaching out to some of the people we've interviewed for the Radical Recovery Summit. We're asking, how can you support people that are struggling during the COVID-19 pandemic? There is a range of programs and support that people are offering, as well as ways to frame this. What is it that's happening inside of you during this time? Come to RadicalRecoverySummit.com to click right through to the interviews.